Hi, Colin Marshall here, letting you know that you can now read a new essay from my upcoming book, A Los Angeles Primer, each and every week at KCET Departures. For details, visit colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Season 3 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. sitting in Santa Monica, Los Angeles, and you live in Seattle, and I wonder, those two cities, they're thought of as the robust Pacific Rim cities of, of the United States. Do you, do you feel an actual connection to Asia in these places? I, I do, uh, primarily because, uh, well, you have a, a good population, a, a large population of, of Asians in both places. You, you go by, uh, I remember coming in from the airport, passing the, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's the Los Angeles equivalent of Uwajimaya, which is our Japanese food store. And you have these Japanese food stores all over the place. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's very much that. And, of course, I had a talk yesterday, and it, and it was uh, surprising how many people who had actually spent time in Yokohama or had relations or connections with Japan in some way. In fact, I just walked by one of those Marukai markets on the way right. here, hoping to get an onigiri, but they're not open until 9 in the morning, so <laughs> I'll get it on the way back. Right. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from Santa Monica, California, speaking with Leslie Helm, who's been a, a, a foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times for Business Week. He's the executive editor of Seattle Business, and he is the author of the new historical memoir, Yokohama Yankee, My Family's Five Generations as Outsiders in Japan. It's funny how, you know, you write in the book about how you, you began writing about business and the Japanese, the, the Japanese, uh, the fears we had about, the, about Japan and that Japan would buy and sell the U.S. for pennies on the dollar. The yen was taking over. Uh, I, I guess we thought that back then. And these days, Japan is not so much in the consciousness, but Japanese stuff never goes away here in America, does it? You know, the, 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 the Marikai markets, the Wajimaya, the, the, the Onigiri, the, the stuff stays around. Japan seems, to, people think less about Japan here, do you think, these days? Uh, definitely it's not in the, you know, Japan, t t they talk these days about, they call it Japan passing, is sort of the sense that people are not looking at them and they're looking at, at, at China as, as the the key next challenge, obviously, you know, when I was reporting in, in the early 80s, uh, the mid-80s and the early 90s, uh, Japan was uh, threatening, you know, one industry after another, whether it was uh, cars or steel or semiconductors or next thing was supposed to be computers. Today, of course, uh, you know, most things are produced in China and, and that's where we are in terms of the economic competition. That's a lot of what, what we, we worry about. Uh, at the same time, you know, when I was young, the notion of people eating sushi was, was you know, Americans just did not like the idea. And now, you know, it's everywhere. It's, it's really part of the, the common culture. So, and of course, uh, um, animation has be become very, very popular among young people. And I think a lot of people now are connected to Japan as a result of those kinds of products, uh, uh, those cultural a attributes like, like animation. Having been born in Japan yourself, tell me what it was like to regard Westerners as they first were grossed out by sushi, to name one example, and then came to accept it as they came to accept other Japanese things. Watching that process as, as someone born in Japan, but not regarded as of it, I guess, in the way that a Japanese person regards another Japanese person. Well, it's in a way, it's been a little bit humbling to me because I always saw myself as a, a bit of a, a cultural interpreter. I, I, I always felt like I would know what Americans would like about Japan. And, and you know, I used to have friends who would take, you know, senbei, these rice crackers, and they would peel off the... the, the and when I, would I thought see, it was a wrapper, the same. Right, right. And uh, I would see this stuff and think, you know, this is never going to be, you know, do well in the States. And then it does incredibly well. And one of the things, for example, that I thought for sure that was the most ridiculous thing that in the world were these TV shows where, you know, people would take baths in worms or they'd, you know, put a 
put a box of insects over someone's head, and I thought, you know, this is the most, this is so Japanese, you know, can you believe that they do this? And of course now these shows are very popular in the United States, and you just never know what's going to what's gonna make a hit here. I feel like the type of variety shows you see on Japanese television are not going to make it over here, though. I mean, that's kind of a standard joke uh, Westerners make in Japan. Like, why, is, why, why are these... Why, why are there so many hours of these comedians standing there on television? You know what I mean. You know these shows, right? Right. Well, those might not make it, but you know they they have these competitions, right? Where you they make these people run from styrofoam things, and they keep falling in the floor and and and, and falling on their faces. I mean, those ones are are, are so silly, and yet uh, Americans uh, are. I mean, they're showing them on TV. I assume somebody's looking at them. <laughs> Off mic, we were talking about how on the show I've had Roland Keltz recently and Todd Shimoda, respectively the observer of Japan and the novelist, and both are half Japanese. And Todd Shimoda had a different experience with his half Japanese-ness in Japan than Roland Keltz does. And how much, how much of your book, Yokohama Yankee, is, how much of the family drama is tied up in the notion of how Japanese one looks or how non-Japanese one looks? Uh, that's been a, a, a very interesting part of the experience. I mean, my own experience has been as essentially a white person passing. Uh, you know, I, I'm a quarter Japanese, so I really don't look Japanese. So I never, I was never, uh, I mean, sometimes when I first came to the States, I would tell people I'm part Japanese, and then they would look at me and say, oh yeah, I noticed your eyes are slanted, or stuff like that, you know, which is, you know, it's, it's a bit absurd. But, um, but and so for me, in a, in a way, uh, because I was passing, it was hard. It was harder in a way because I, I never really confronted the fact that I was part Japanese, and, and it wasn't until much later, and I started this book, that I really started looking at at into it and realized that in fact a lot of my attitudes, a lot of my experiences, were colored by that experience of of, of, of my my parents' generations, where, where they were. My my father was half Japanese. But in earlier generations, uh, in my grandfather's generation, for example, um, I tell the story of one particular uh, cousin who's well. It's it's actually in many cases where where the family will have three or four children, and two of them look white, and one of them looks very Japanese. And at that time, in the, the, we're talking now about the 1920s, 1910s. The, the person who looked more Japanese clearly faced a lot more challenges, had a, a lot more difficult times. And in one case, the, the father, the parents actually uh, you know, discriminated against their own child who looked more Japanese, which, which it was pretty shocking. They, they, in, in terms of inheritance, the, person, the, the, the daughter received less money, uh, the, the parents refused to go to the daughter's wedding. Um, so it, it, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a it's a reminder of how powerful that notion of ethnic identity was. And of course, that was the time when, you know, 1923 was when uh, the United States passed the Exclusion Act. They, the whole notion that America should be a white country, that we shouldn't be allowing Asians or blacks or anyone of... Uh, of um, you know, colored people to be to be coming into this country because it would dilute us and then we wouldn't be accepted among the civilized nations of the world. So that was a, it was a tough time then. There was a time then that, that the genetic lottery was even within a family you might look a certain way and that will change the entire course of your life. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was if you if you look more Japanese at that time. Your chances of, of <clears throat> you know, marrying into a, a better family or a wealthier family were less uh, in many, many ways. That found, of course, you know, heading into World War II, that was a huge challenge. I mean, people who who looked more Japanese. Uh, one, I had one great aunt who actually lived in. Uh, in, in, in Los Angeles, she she uh, she uh, passed away a few years ago. Uh, she lived in Venice, but um, you know she stayed with her aunt, her own you know her mother's sister uh, for for several months, and she talked about how you know they the, her own aunt would talk to her about being yellow and 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 being uh, embarrassed about showing her in society. So when when her aunt had guests, she was told to stay in her room. So uh, you, you sort of imagine the impact that kind of thing can have on somebody. I mean, you, you just you get isolated. You get you know you, you're, 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 your confidence is shattered. You're, you're treated worse. It's a it's a it's a difficult. At the time, it was very difficult. <laughs> 
I, th- I think people interested in Japan now think of Yokohama as an extension of Tokyo, but you go back generations, it's something very different, isn't it? That's right. Yokohama is, is a very unique uh, place. Uh, in the first place, it was it, it was the first it was the first region in which Japan really confronted uh, Western, modern Western civilization, and the first place really where the West learned about Japan. When, uh, just as, as a brief history, uh, when Commodore Perry came in, in to Japan in 1853 and basically said, you know, open up or else, you got to trade with us. I mean, Japan had been closed for 250 years, and uh, because Japan was behind technologically and militarily, it really had no choice but to, to open up. But it wanted to limit foreign influence in Japan, and so it created, it, there was a little village uh, in Yokohama, it was called Yokohama, that was surrounded uh, by canals and rivers on one side and the, and the ocean on the other side, and so they basically kicked out the villagers and turned that into a settlement, and that's where the first traders from Britain and, and uh, Germany and the United States all had little uh, compounds there, and that's where trade first occurred. And so, you know, the first telegraph systems, the first uh, railroads, the first bakeries, all, all that happened right there in Yokohama. And that really, until relatively recently, continued to be uh, to color the character of the city. I mean, today there are still areas that you, you can feel that foreign influence, although, unfortunately, many of the the old buildings have been just uh, knocked down. Now, I've never read a story before of a family like yours who, as the subtitle says, goes back five generations in Japan as outsiders. But it seems like Yokohama is the place that's going to happen, if it can happen, if it could have happened any place. Is that right? That's right. I mean, there there is another area. There was an island uh, uh, in, uh, in called Nagasaki that... Uh, uh, off, off of Nagasaki, where they allowed uh, the Dutch uh, were allowed to trade with Japan for a while, but it was very, very small uh, number. I mean, I think it was in the in the dozens, and 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 they deliberately prevented a lot of interaction between. So there there are a, a, a few families that go back a little further back into the. In fact, I, in, in a different part of my family, there's also uh, there are. Uh, it turns out I have uh, a family that have graves in Nagasaki, you know, from the 1850s. But, but yeah, my great grandfather arrived in uh, Yokohama in 1869, and at that point, uh, Yokohama had only been open for 10 years. So that was almost about as early as you could get there. You write in the book that when he showed up, he was so rooted in his. Germanic identity that it wasn't a problem being in Japan. That's is that something you see across your family tree? The people who really know where they came from are the ones who had an easier time of it. Well, I think that's true of everybody in life. I think people that uh, have a strong sense of who they are. Uh, typically, they've been raised in communities. They have, they have parents who have that strong sense of who they are. That confidence. And I think that makes a world of difference to to a person. I I, I really envy people who have that um, that that sense of of self and 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 and, and confidence. Uh, and certainly, it, it, when I look at my my forebears, my grandfather on my mother's side, my they were both Germans. My my great grandfather, they they were Germans, and that was that was. The, the very strong belief, and in, 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 in on my mother's side, even even when you know the Nazis were taking over, and you know he, he really was embarrassed and shamed about what was happening in Germany. He he was said my job was to to tell the Japanese about the true Germany. You know that this is not the true Germany. You know again this incredible sense of of the history of Germany that there were great things and that 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 Hitler was an aberration. You know it was still there's still that you know. That uh, pride in, in, in their in country and, and who they were. So being able to describe oneself as a German in Japan is a bit easier than describing yourself as a quarter Japanese uh, born in Japan who now lives in America, right? Well, yes. I mean, the, the Japanese in particular have, you know, historically, I think, um, they've created this myth about themselves as being this pure race and it's not a reality but it's it's the way they project themselves and uh, so they they're very uncomfortable with 
the notion of part Japanese, and 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 if you even to this day, people who are part Japanese tend to be. Um, I wouldn't say the periphery of society, but very much in the in the uh, the Geno Shakai, which means the the, the world of uh, of the of music and and television and in the in the arts and entertainment world is very much heavily populated with with uh, people of, of mixed blood. Whereas um, you know foreigners, and even among foreigners, of course, it's there's different you know categories. You know, you, you they they tend to. Uh, in, historically, have treated you know Koreans, for example, not not with as much respect. I mean, today now, of course, Korean soap operas are very very popular in Japan, and it's amazing for me to see that because when I was growing up, the, they were they treated Koreans you know abysmally. You'd have to go to a bad neighborhood to eat Korean food, right? Right. There, there was very much the sense that there was a close association between the Koreans and the Untouchables, that were also another you know group of people that were were looked down on. Um, so whereas whereas certainly among whites you know there is a if you were german you were associated with you know with beethoven and with goethe and with with the whole literary tradition if you were american it was you know freedom and you know jefferson and so so there was all these positive uh, associations and uh they 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 felt comfortable relating to you uh, in that sense, and so I actually, uh, in my book, I mentioned briefly about this. But early in my journalism career, I, when I shared with people the fact that I was part Japanese, they suddenly felt kind of uncomfortable. I felt, and so I, I stopped talking about that. I would mention that I was born and raised in Japan, but I would never talk about being part Japanese. That's of course changed. I mean, it's, uh, I've outed myself in a sense. <laughs> well, no, it's it's a, we're in. It's not that. Not that much time has passed since then, but we are in a different era in that sense, aren't we? I mean, maybe Japan is no more comfortable with part Japanese people than it ever was, but certainly the West is... Uh, is they, I mean, we, we have an internationalism that likes that kind of thing, right, these days? Uh, absolutely. And even in Japan, I, you know, uh, I get some reactions from people who say, oh, what, you know, what are you talking about? In fact, you know, I, I, my kids wish they were half Japanese, or I wished I was half Japanese, because they're, they're, they're good looking, and they, they, they get these good jobs on television. And, and so there is this sense that it's kind of hip, it's cool to be, to be half um, so I, I think it is it's certainly e e easier now in Japan. And, and in the States, uh, we have these great new models. I mean, Tiger Woods, uh, uh, Barack Obama. I mean, these people who, who've made it and who, who actually take pride in, in, in their uh, mixed heritage. And it's, it's a really wonderful thing. And, of course, you know, the census now, you're able to uh, uh, mark the box that says, I'm not just Asian, I'm not just, I'm not just in one box or another. I'm kind of a mix, and, that, and, and I'm proud of it. And the number of people who self-identify as mixed has, has grown, you know, exponentially. So there's, a, yeah, it's a it's a great age to, in that sense. You mentioned the the driving myth in Japan of the the uniqueness of the race and the purity of the race, and in the book you talk about your frustrations that developed with all these ideas the Japanese had about well we're different we're, we're different this way and this way and this way we can't do things the same way we can't eat American beef or what have you. How how quickly did that Frustration develop within you. Oh, you know, as a as a uh, that in the, in the early early eighties, uh, just for context, um, I was writing a lot about. So Japan was exporting very successfully to the United States, and the question was why wasn't Japan importing more American products? And uh, in fact, it had over generations. Japan had had a government policy, an industrial policy that encouraged exports and discouraged imports. So there were many institutional barriers. But the way they explained it was always in in cultural terms. And they would say, "Yeah, our our I can't remember whether it was our." Uh, uh, intestines are too long or too short, but one way or the other, it was like we're not as good at digesting beef, or, or the snow is different, so the skis overseas are not as good, or there was always some reason. In fact, and and, and it really played against their benefits because I, I remember one time uh, talking to an executive of a big Japanese uh, manufacturer uh, of semiconductors, and I mentioned how Korea the Koreans were doing very well, 
And he said, oh, the Koreans will never succeed because they don't have clean water like we have in Japan. And then they eat too much garlic, naturally. <laughs> right. So, and of course now, you know, Korea is over, uh, surpassing Japan in, in, in many of these areas. So, um, you know, turning to those easy answers uh, ends up undercutting your own competitiveness. Now, you're, you're, I think, the best person to ask this because being from Japan, having written about business and Japanese business for so long, what, what happened to Japan exactly? What, why, why was it such a powerhouse in the 80s and has now been on the skids for 20 years? Like, no one that I talk to who hasn't spent time in Japan really understands why Japan went from so a scary uh, powerhouse to a uh, kind of juggernaut to essentially treated as irrelevant these days. Right. Uh, well, I would say two things. Um, one was uh, they have not they, they had been very good in the in the in the catch up stage, which was, you know, uh, following what was happening in 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 the, in the United States and elsewhere, and then improving on it. And so that was true in air, in in cars. That was true in computers. Korea did better moving beyond that, primarily because. Many many of the Korean executive leaders uh, got their PhDs in the United States, and they thought like Americans. Uh, they had they had a, a different way of looking at innovation and thinking, and and so they they were actually able to push forward. Japan tended not to do that. They early in their development, there were a lot of people who were educated in the United States, but in Japan. You have to be a, a graduate of a, of, a, of a Japanese university, or you're not really respected. And Japanese universities are pretty good, but but in, in, in the area of research, that they're, they're not necessarily um, always at, at, the, at the forefront. And the other thing I would say is really important is Japan's skills were very much uh, uh, a crafts based. They were very good at uh, mechanical. Uh, miniaturization, uh, but when the skill set became increasingly uh, software based, so it was about identifying a problem and then turning that problem into software. Uh, both you know, the, the identifying the problem is a very uh, analytical type of skill set that I don't think the Japanese educate for that, and then the, the writing the software. Japan tended to treat software in the way, same way as factory products, and so they were focused on removing bugs and how could we increase productivity to, you know, produce more software uh, more efficiently. But that's not what makes for good software. What makes for good software is, you know, identifying the problems, writing these strong algorithms that get to the solution quickly, and uh, that's something that that they've never really uh, effectively done. I mean, they're, they're good at doing software that. That's in machines, for example. That's in, it's called embedded software, uh, but but in terms of uh, uh, of the broader use of software, which has become so important on the web, uh, they still remain pretty weak. And what does it mean that the level of English is so low in Japan? Uh, it seems like that's not a good sign. And Japanese friends tell me that it isn't. But uh, what do you, what do you think? Well, it's it's true. I mean, you, 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 your our experience, and this changed somewhat. But when I was growing up, our experience, my experience was, you know, you'd be on the train, or, and there would be somebody trying to speak to you and say, you know, can I practice English conversation? And and you'd have trouble, and you'd struggle with it. And the, the conversation at the end, they would explain to you that they were an English teacher in a in a Japanese school. For a long time, they were using you know Japanese who didn't speak English very well as their as as English teachers. It obviously, was a major problem. They then in, introduced the jet program, which is an incredible program it's su supported by the Japan Foundation, and uh, that's been incredibly successful, and I think done a lot to improve the English. But even today, uh, Japan's educational system, very, very centralized. Uh, the uh, the ministry, of, ministry of Education tends to be, uh, I would say, a little bit backward in many ways, and uh, uh, the way of, you know... We, we all, those of us who've learned foreign languages, know that the way you learn it is you, you speak it. I mean, you listen to it, you speak it, and uh, repeat it. Biting of the bullet to do there as right. well that some people don't want to do. Right. And, and and in Japan, they continue the very old system of focusing on on. You get so caught up in the in the grammar and and, and writing things out that you, people become afraid to actually use it and speak it. And uh, 
that I think that's a big barrier. Now, your family became established in the in the shipping industry and became well known. Did that make it easier to do the the family research this book required, which is a considerable amount? Uh, to some extent, although I I was a little bit late getting to it. Uh, by the time I started. Uh, kind of in the early 90s, the company had been uh, it was sold in the 73 in 1970, so 20 years earlier. But there were still uh, peop- a fair number of people around. I, I and I would run into people. By uh, I, I used to be in the uh, vice president of the Foreign Correspondents Club in Japan, and I remember talking to the accountant there once, and he mentioned that he had previously been an accountant for Helm Brothers, and so I'd run into these people who'd done business and uh, with with the family company. But it was still a challenge because two, you know, Yokohama is totally destroyed twice. First in the earthquake in 1923, everything burned down. And then again in uh, the uh, fire bombings in World War II, burned, everything burned down again. So there was very, very little uh, documentation. And uh, fortunately, some of the material had been sent overseas. So I had some of that. But also J- Japanese um, uh, databases still remain really difficult to use. So uh, going, doing newspaper searches w- w- was uh, quite difficult. I mean, you know, you had to sit there and go through page after page. There's, there's no uh, Google. More and more there's stuff on Google because they're actually um, scanning a lot of these old, old newspapers. But it, w- it, was, it was a challenge. And one complicating factor seems to have been that once out of your family's hands, the company seemed to have taken on a bad reputation. Is that right? That's right. It's a, it's a, it's kind of an interesting story because uh, when I started the research, somebody gave me this uh, this book. Uh, it was a murder mystery, and uh, it's it has it's one of those those books that has like a gun on the cover, you know. And you think, oh, it's like a pot boiler, you know, detective story. And the first opening scene is the, you know this dead body is found in the in this apartment that's owned by the they call it the Heim brothers. They changed the name a little bit, but it was clearly a reference to our company. And apparently, I guess we, uh, my family, sold the company uh, because of you know foreign shareholders wanted to get rid- get to sell it. Uh, to a Hong Kong company, a, a British company, actually, and they in turn sold it to a, a Taiwanese company that uh, essentially proceeded to uh, strip the assets because you weren't allowed to move money out of the country. So they they sold off the land. The guy was involved in gambling, built up debts, uh, and 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 yeah, there was some a couple. One guy I think was, was thrown in prison. So yeah, within the name was kind of besmirched a little bit. At what point did you find you had an intellectual interest in in your own family? Well, you know, I'd been interested, you know, in in a general way uh, for a while. I had sort of known about the past, but but never really felt compelled to to, to look into it. And it, it was when I uh, first my my father passed away and. I realized how he had never really found a home either in Japan or the United States, and that uh, I kind of worried that about the same thing happened to, happening to me. It was sort of he's right to the end of his life; he really hadn't settled on his identity. And the second thing was, uh, you know, more importantly, um, my wife and I—I I was in Japan writing for the uh, Los Angeles Times when uh, we decided to adopt Japanese kids. We, 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 we met some friends that had actually adopted and, and, and ha- were very happy with the experience. And I began wondering, uh, as I thought about it, I began to realize that I, I had this sort of negative view of Japan, uh, maybe partly because of my reporting and the sort of the, the, w- the way Japan responds to, the, to, to outsiders and, and so on, but also because my own family had tried to hide its Japanese identity over generations, you know, tied to the, you know, being uh, uh, during the war, you know, just the, the sort of attitude towards mixed blood. So um, I, I saw that in myself and wondered if I, I could really be a good father uh, with that kind of attitude towards Japan. And that really was was a, 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 an important driving factor in, in, in really looking into the family. 
be right for me to say your kids are they're, they're Japanese in the exact inverse way from you as, as in they they look in Japanese but grew up western whereas you grew up Japanese and look western does that make sense um, that's true I, and and uh and in, in, in a strange way, um, we, and I often feel bad about this, uh, you know, I, we imposed a degree of outsider status on them right, right off the bat because um, they will always, I mean, we look so different. I mean, my, my wife and I are white and they're Asian. The minute people see us together, they know they're adopted. So... Right away, they're put in a in a different box in a way, um, but they they do f- I think feel proud about being part Japanese. Uh, we've we've uh, raised them. You know, when they were young, for a long time we didn't let them see any American television. We only watch let them watch Japanese videos. So they're my my daughter's Japanese is pretty good. My my son's. Understands more than he he he, uh, he speaks, but both of them, uh, I think they sort of take pride in having having both uh, a Japanese and an American background. We talk about the difficulties of being a Japanese outsider, but listeners heard on this show conversations I recorded around Kansai a few months ago, and it was a refrain some long-term expats there would have. They would say. Yeah, there are problems being an outsider in Japan, but at least I'm not Japanese in Japan. Then I would be involved in a, this web, this, this terrible web of social obligations and just bound in so many ways. And I heard that enough that I started to look around me and think, you know, maybe it is better to be an outsider here. What's, what's your perspective on that? Does it seem like the insiders have it in some ways just as bad? Yeah, I don't know if, 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 if I would say necessarily bad, but I would say... I think you know when you're part of a community, you have that that web of of uh, obligations, and that's part of what grounds you in a way. And uh, the more the traditional the society, the more those those networks exist. And so there's a bit of a trade-off. I mean, I think the the more freer you are, in, say in a place like Los Angeles, you feel free and you don't have to worry about people but at the same time you don't have that support network that you have so it's it's a plus and minus uh, when i was young i i did have that attitude that i i didn't want to have anything to do with you know worrying about you know god did i do everything right am i you know and i and I, but as a result i didn't have that deep connection uh, to people and to communities and now it, through the course of my book, I've I've met a lot of relatives, met many new friends, and I do want to keep those ties. Uh, I feel both for myself and for my kids. I think it's important for me to have that network to be part of Japan, and so I do take the effort now. <laughs> and it's it's sometimes complicated. It's it's you you never really. I think the Japanese never really know what exactly is the right thing to do in a, in a particular situ- situation, and so you make mistakes. You know I. Uh, I remember one time where, you know, uh, a distant relative I'd reconnected with had paid for my dinner like, you know, three or four times in a row. And I just realized this is going too far. And so I did the thing that you do in Japan where um, you sneak out and say, I have to go to the bathroom. And then you go and you pay the bill and you come and you come back and, and, and then, you know, there's no argument. You don't have to fight over the bill. Well, this particular case, I thought that would be the right thing to do. Well, in this case, the people were so upset, you know, that it was like, you know, we were going to visit you in America, but now we can't visit you. And I felt like, oh, my God, I, I, I tried to do the right thing, but still couldn't get it right. They, they had another way in mind to balance the scales then. They, they were going to do something else rather than have you pay one time, and you scotched that plan? Right. I think their feeling at some level was if, if we... You know, piled up enough obligations that that then they could come and visit me in America and not feel bad about it. It's like those those ads in comic books uh, 30, 40 years ago. You sell seeds door to door, and you can get a skateboard. Like you just, <laughs> it's it's not so different a principle, is it? it? It's not. And in fact, you know, as a reporter, I hate to say it, but I I kind of use that as well. I would 
you know, uh, back in the old days when we have, you know, we had good budgets and stuff, I would take somebody that I thought would be a good client and take them to a really nice meal, and I would know that in Japan they would feel an obligation towards me, and I could count on uh, tapping into that. It seems like Japan now needs outsiders to keep the country going. Is, do you think that's true? I, I absolutely do. I, I think Japan faces uh, a couple major challenges. One is they've continued to make life pretty difficult for women. Um, women are expected, to, if, if they work, they can work, but they're less likely to have uh, to be promoted through the career, through the ranks, and they're expected to cook and do the laundry and the, everything else. As a result, many women, you know, are not getting married or they're getting married very late. Uh, fewer of them are having children. Again, women are expected to make sure their kids go to the best schools, and if they don't, they're like considered failure. And there's huge pressure. So, a lot of women are just choosing not to have kids. And uh, that, plus the fact that there's a, just a general aging population, means uh, Japan, a recent number I thought, I think that the height Japan had maybe a population of 130 million. And I was, I think it was in 15, 20, 30 years, something in the very near future, it's going to be down to 85 million or something. And you think of the infrastructure of universities and roads and sewage systems, the entire system is going to, it's going to be. Ha- be hard put to support all that with a much smaller population and yet unlike the United States Japan doesn't welcome immigrants. Uh, Immigrants who come to the country have a, a real hard time. They face discrimination. The Japanese blame them for crime rates uh, they never feel really a part of, of the country. So, plus, they tend to not be given the kinds of uh, responsibilities. I mean, I saw this one statistic recently. It was really amazing that uh, somebody looked at the top patents in, uh, filed in the United States in the last two years or something, and 76% of our top patents, uh, one of the inventors was, was a foreign, foreign-born uh, 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 person. So foreign uh, immigrants, I mean, immigrants have been, played a critical role in, in our innovation system, creating new companies, creating new jobs. And Japan just doesn't have that. It's fascinating that they were able, Japan was able to adopt so much from uh, post-war America as, the, oh, this is how America does it, and then improve upon it. They didn't adopt the, did they not realize America was doing that with a lot of immigration as well? You know, that's, that's the one thing they didn't uh, replicate. Yeah, the toughest thing, I think, is that when it comes to culture, um, Japan, I think I mentioned earlier that they have this image of themselves as this pure race, of, of uh, that, J- that Japan is special. And there's a real reluctance to, uh, to change that. That, that, that there's a sense that their identity as Japanese uh, depends on you know, maintaining certain things. And uh, there's a great worry that... Um, uh, that changing that could really be uh, they would not they wouldn't be Japanese anymore. You know, I I, I had a really weird uh, uh, conversation once with a, a professor of Tokyo University who I was asking about the fact that the Japanese many of the Japanese refused to admit that the the Nan- Nanking massacres occurred, and I, I just couldn't understand it and. He said, you know, if that were true, that would mean the Japanese are bad people. You know, it, 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 was, it was like a, it was a reflection on a whole culture. And so it wasn't, there was this reluctance to say, well, no, that was a mistake and we can move on. Um, and the same way, um, the, the, the New York Times had a wonderful piece a while ago about a little village in, um, in Kyushu, the uh, southwestern island, where the... Uh, village was like the average age was 75 or 80 and there was some American uh, that uh, was teaching English there and for some reason ended up being uh, elected mayor. It was an was a un- unusual story. But one of the things he wanted to do, he said there was half the village was was empty. There, there was nobody living there. So he wanted to encourage young people to move into this village and the old villagers uh, opposed it. 
they didn't want to change their village culture. They didn't want young people in, even though that would mean the village would die. It, it was they were a, ready to make the sacrifice. Right. The, the, it was more important to be who they were than to than to see that continue. And uh, you have to wonder whether Japan is going to just keep shrinking and shrinking or whether they're going to finally wake up and say, you know, if we want to live, you know, ultimately you want your, your culture to survive. <laughs> Are the Japanese allowed to believe their country is not riding high anymore? Or is that, is that officially permitted, uh, an officially permitted admission, if you know what I mean? Or, or I'm, I would imagine they're not allowed to acknowledge in some sense that Korea has taken the place that Japan once had in the global economy. But how much is acknowledged, I guess, is what I want to ask. I, I think that maybe, I think to, to a degree they, they, they understand. I mean, they've watched the, the, the economy. They've, of course, now the stock market's doing better, so maybe things are looking up. But I think generally they understand that they're... In a, in a crisis and that they face uh, a, a serious problem but there's there's no clear way out you know the 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 politicians who get elected find constantly that in order to prop up their support they have to turn to the past so they keep looking to the old values they keep looking to uh, sort of anti-chinese sentiment or they find ways you know old sort of worn out ways that aren't going to work rather than coming up with sort of new solutions that might that might really address the problems. They, they come within steps of just tying on the rising sun headband, right? Right. It's 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 sad to see how they keep uh, coming back to you know the denial of of, of crimes of World War II. Uh, it's it's a it's a real uh, it's a real challenge, I think. And there seems to be some other effect at work here. Uh, someone from Japan, or a, someone someone else half Japanese who goes back and forth, said to me. What other country can you think of that burns through, what is it, six prime ministers in six years without any social disruption at all? Right. Like, what, what does that mean? What, what does that mean about Japan? Well, it, it goes back to the fact that the, the, the Japanese system and in, in, in the, the democracy was really, you know, installed by the American occupation. And to, to a degree, it's a, it's a uh, superficial covering over the old system of, of bureaucrats that still really run the com country. So, I mean, the good, the good side of it is you have stability. The bad side of it is you have difficulty moving in a new direction. Uh, you can move in new directions, but only in very, very small ways. What has, what did, what, what's something that researching the experience of your family taught you about Japan that you, you didn't know before you looked at all the generations of your family in Japan, all the people you could find out about. The, the sort of experience as a whole of the family, what, what does that show you about Japan, or what do you, th what do you hope it shows people about Japan? Wow, that's a very good question. I had studied uh, about you know, the, the family structure, and, uh, but I never really understood it until I actually sat in a room with, you know, an, an old relative who had, you know, who was sort of the patriarch of his family and how much the, the whole really old system of, of the, they called it the Ie, which is the household, the, the, that in the villages those institutions still exist and still color the way things are done and um, the extent to which you know I to me I, I hadn't really understood Shintoism you know is the, is the sort of native uh, religion and uh, one of my relatives that I, I rediscovered was a Shinto priest and he was able to explain it to me in a way that I had never understood it and it really is about uh, it's it's about culture and and tradition and reinstilling old you know the the, the values of, of 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 Japan and they you know in a, it's a weird thing to say but um, so so this guy who's a Shinto priest he also happens to be 
like the scoutmaster in his area. And you know, it's I, I think there's a there's a there's an interesting comparison there because the Boy Scouts to the extent that they still, you know, are are in many communities, exist as a way to uh, instill s- certain values uh, that some of us think are, are old, old-fashioned, but they're certainly core principles of what it means to be an American and and uh, uh, you know what, how you should behave, you know, brave, trustworthy, friendly, courteous, kind, that whole thing, and 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 that that. Role is played by by the old you know Shinto um, religion, and you don't see it on the surface in Japan, but deep down there's that's still there. I do hear it. It's become sort of a trope that I have internalized about Japan that the core Japanese ness not not to sound like a, a Japanese person talking about this themselves, but that the core never changes. So they even Japan stays foreign. Uh, to to a Westerner, even if they adopt Western styles or gadgets or architectural uh, architectural innovations or what have you, the the uh, there's a core that remains and that foreignizes everything that gets that, that goes there. I mean, does that seem plausible to you? Uh, I I, th- I think there is a, there is an element of that, and I, and and in fact, um, but there's also an element I think that being in Japan, I mean, I mean, the the thing that makes me hopeful is that the, the 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 people that are not part of that core are growing. There's a more there are more and more outsiders, so to speak, in Japan, and that that part of the the people that really fit that character of that traditional Japanese uh, that was like the Shin, the Shinto priest relatives, his friends, the 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 people that are part of the old system of the big corporations and the bureaucrats that. That is is a smaller and smaller part of the whole society. More and more people, I think, are feeling excluded from that. And at some point, you wonder whether that's going to change. And, and of course, part of that also is, you know, you, you meet people that are, are completely Japanese and grew up and educated in Japan, but they come to L.A. and they've lived here for 5 or 10 or 15 years. You know, they're no longer Japanese, really. I mean, when they go back to Japan, they feel excluded. So... It's, it, there's, that's an interesting point where you know a German who leaves Germany can still feel very very German. A Japanese who leaves Japan in some case in some respects is no longer Japanese in the same way that they were. I mean, it's a it's a strange um, notion, uh, but uh, I think part of being Japanese is being in Japan and, 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 and uh, yeah. And Los Angeles may be. I don't know about extreme case, but people do go native here in some sense. The Englishmen are historically the ones who, uh, when they embrace this place, they, they really embrace it. Does the same thing happen in, say, uh, Seattle? If someone Japanese comes there and they get Seattleized? I think I think they do. Although, in the same case, you know, in in LA, you can you'll you'll have a whole population of Japanese who, like you say, are are, are localized, but still, many of them will hang out with each other. You know, they're in, they're among the Japanese community, and so it's um, they're they are adopting their own culture. But but part of it is that that our culture accepts those subgroups, you know, that we're willing to say, okay, there are people, the Somalis that have their Somali world and and we don't necessarily say they're outsiders, you know it's, it's acceptable to have to, to have differences and, and we actually encourage diversity at some level There's almost not a way you can be an outsider in Los Angeles or an insider I don't know if it holds for all of America but that seems to be the way here, doesn't it? Yeah, it is interesting. I had a foreign editor at uh, at the LA Times who once said that uh, you know we have uh, take any country in the in the world, and LA has at least a couple hundred thousand of them. Right, exactly. <laughs> There's a banner you see when you come into LAX with Via Ragosa's face, and it says "Welcome to the city that's a world in itself." And I guess people don't always agree with him here, but that's one way they have to, I suppose. Yokohama Yankee, your book, is put out by Chin Music Press. Uh, we mentioned Todd Shimoda. He's a co-owner, and they're based, of course, in Seattle. They, they have a mission of bridging Seattle and, uh, and Asia, essentially. And they always put out visually lavish books. This is a painstakingly designed book. I, as I understand it, you worked fairly closely with the designer, and as you would have to, on this book? Uh, yeah, it was a real pro- 
pleasure. Uh, Josh Powell is, is the designer, and uh, he actually, we talked earlier about the JET program, which the Japanese developed to encourage uh, Americans to come to, uh, foreigners to come to Japan and teach Japanese. And he was on that program. He was very interested in karate. So he had a great love of, of Japan, and I was really lucky to have him. I, I had a pile of, you know, albums, you know, sky high and 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 stock certificates and and photographs and stamp collection that my grandmother had collected and he took all those things and pulled out design elements and and the thing that impressed me the most is that the the images are so well integrated with the narrative so that's almost an organic part of the the read which is i think really unusual in in a book and what's also unusual is that you know i see people who are interested in, in their family's genealogy put together books of some kind that document their family's history, but they're for the family. They, we pass them around at the reunion, say, "This is here's some details about your great great grandparents." Here you have you have your family's history, but you also have a a book that's selling well and lavishly designed and for everybody to read. You know what 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 did it take to make your family's story? one that you wanted to share not just with your family that that's a very good question um i think there's a a couple things uh one is i think i felt there was a in addition to the family story and the story about um identity which i think has a universal uh uh resonance i think identity and sort of the sense of being outsider i think you know, most of us in some situation or another will feel like an outsider. And um, so telling a story of one family and how that, that developed, I thought, would be would be uh, an in- interesting exercise. And in a, in a sense, if you're an outsider um, and you and you you worry about it and you internalize it it can it can be kind of a corruptive thing but in in this case where i I wrote about it and and, and it was it was kind of like a, a therapy session for me but you once once you put it on the table and you realize hey this is something to embrace it's not something to worry about i think and I think that's true of of all these things uh, where we feel we're outsiders well. You know what is it special about that? And 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 if and if you embrace it, it's 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 texture, it's richness, it, it adds to your life. It's not it's not a negative thing. Uh, but the other thing I think that's that that I felt had value was, um, in a sense, it's a it's a it's a it's a short history of Japan. You know, the fact that it spans essentially a, you know 144 years and in in the most a period uh, when Japan went through yeah. wrenching changes and, 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 and horrible, you know, uh, wars and, and, and earthquakes, and, and to some extent, um, I think Japan, you know, nations, I think, go through the same kind of identity crisis that 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 individuals do, and I think in in this period, Japan came went from a very isolated, you know, knew who it was to suddenly being faced with this existential threat from the West, and then, you know, almost feeling like it was going to be a colony, and then now then it becomes a colonizer because it wants to be like the West. It's sort of this sort of insider outsider it, in Japan actually felt, I think, being that one of the reasons it ended up becoming a colonizer was I think it it uh, it was excluded, you know, at, at some level from the the, the the family of nations at the time and uh, so that I think is a, is a is a history it's a way of looking at, at Japanese history as well through through one foreign family's eyes so I thought those elements uh, made it you know potentially interesting to to non-family members at what moments in America do you yourself feel foreign oh you know Anytime people are talking about sports, <laughs> I I have to say I'm I, I'm beginning to learn it, but I still can't I still can't understand uh, football and, and 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 basketball and uh, so so that's certainly an element. Uh, I have uh, I have traits prop probably that are Japanese to me in the sense that I. Feel very um, 
J Japanese have the very strong sense of not disturbing other people, and uh, it's called endo. You know, you 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 hold yourself back, and uh, in this country, uh, that's not a good trait to have. <laughs> you, if you want to be successful, you got to push forward, and you got to be maybe a little pushy and and, and make yourself present and and have an impact, and uh, that's that's been a bit of a challenge for me. Do you think America has something to learn still from Japan, from what Japan has done well? Well, I think one thing. That's a that's a, a really a good question. I think one thing America could learn from uh, is a little bit more uh, self restraint in in terms of uh, the exercise of foreign power. Uh, Japan has been over backwards, you know, since it really adopted and took to heart the. Uh, the American Constitution that was imposed on Japan about about not you know being, not being allowed to go to war essentially, and so Japan will do just about anything to avoid uh, conflict overseas, and to some extent that's that's perhaps a challenge because it doesn't exert power in in both either negative or positive ways, but it I think. I think we overexert our power, and then and we get involved in situations that we don't understand, and we create problems in places like Afghanistan and Iraq that where where there were problems, but we didn't really have the answer. I think we have a tendency to be the other opposite. Uh, we we have a tendency to think we know all the answers, that everything would be fine if people were more like us, and uh, that that's you know. A real, I think, a real problem. I mean, Japanese don't want to change, but they also don't expect other people to change. They're not expecting you to be more like them, for example. And uh, I think we need to to understand that other people have, other countries have their own way of doing things, and that it's not really up to us to to uh, change that. Do you foresee America or, or Japan having an easier time dealing with their own worst tendencies? In the coming decades, that's that's an interesting uh, challenge on both sides. I think I feel like right now we're uh, America is in a in a period of, of self reflection and uh, it's difficult. And you know, the guns are a great example where where we realize there's a problem, but really haven't grappled with how we can deal with it. Uh, but I think we're at least having that debate, which is which is really healthy. Uh, Japan, too, as I mentioned before, although they're not openly dealing with a lot of their problems, there are more and more foreigners, and little by little, you are beginning to see people with uh, different kinds of backgrounds in positions of influence, and. I'm I'm hopeful that uh, sometime in the next 20 years, that Japan is going to recognize that there is a way that you can protect your culture and 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 maintain your traditions and still, you know, be more welcoming of diversity and still be more accepting of you know sort of universal values and. And uh, in Japan, in some respects, could 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 do a better job if 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 it can figure that out. Because I think that's you know the kinds of ch problems that the Islamic world is facing. Um, there's a lot of countries that need to, to 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 find a way in terms of protecting their culture and moving forward in the, in, a, in a global economy. And if Japan can can show the way that, I mean, I, that's as good an answer as anybody can ask for, I think. And as an outsider from Japan, nice to see some outsiders gaining traction there, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it makes for, I think, their understanding that it makes for a more interesting life, actually. Yeah. I've been speaking here in Santa Monica with Leslie Helm, who is the executive editor at Seattle Business and the author of Yokohama Yankee, My Family's Five Generations as Outsiders in Japan. Leslie, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Thanks.
And special thanks to everybody who backed Season 3 on Kickstarter, including Paige Calvert, Jonathan Crow, Douglas Dollars, Paul Doyle, John French, Eric Graham, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Kimberly Hahn, Carl Haley, Stefan Halperin, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Matthew Licky, Mr. Munvirzi, Rob Montz, Lindsay Muniak, Daniel Murphy, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Blake Riley, Rob Schultz, Cam Smith, Small Demons, Todd Shimoda, Kevin Smokler, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.